Yeah, and the even months we are trying to meet at the Mission Valley Library for our Right to Die Film Festival. And that's a lot of fun. There are a lot of wonderful movies about the Right to Die. And the next one is very relevant to what's going on, what will go on here in California. It's called How to Die in Oregon. We've showed it before. It's been on KPBS. It's a frontline film, a documentary. And it'll show you what the role of the volunteers are, what it's like to take the medication, uh, who these people are that are using the law. And um, that will be the model we're trying to set up here in San Diego for San Diegans. We can't cover the whole 39 million people in California, but Stephanie will talk about how CMC is doing that. But we hope to set up a personal volunteer um, situation so that people, at least in the Hemlock Society of San Diego, will be able to use the law and we can walk them through it. But that's going to take um, money and staff, and we have to talk about that as we go on. Our next, so that, that um, film is February 21st at the Mission Valley Library. And if you're on our email list or on our, yeah, our email list, uh, you will get a notice about all of our meetings and anything exciting that's coming up. If you have snail mail, uh, we send out a newsletter every two months and it's very hard to contact you. So if you have snail mail, try to teach yourself email. <laughs> I'm sure you've heard this from your grandchildren. <laughs> um, we are, we've been taping our meetings thanks to Ken Watson, who has very sophisticated equipment here and knows a lot about the law and how you get permission and all that kind of thing. So um, before, we were not having the Q&A taped because of legal concerns. So he asked me to read this to you. We are filming this to go into our website. It goes into our website. It also goes onto YouTube. By the way, if you, want to, if you missed uh, previous meetings, take a look at our website, which is wonderful, uh, run by Pat Fisher. Where, where are you, Pat? Take a bow. She's back there. She runs our website. Uh, and our wonderful board, part of our board is here, too. Um, Larry Price is there. Said, raise your hand. Miss Tomita, Bob Duffield back there. Who did I miss? Bill Simmons. And who else? Oh, Will Wake, who sets all this up for the last 28 years been doing it. How did I miss it? And we have other board members that aren't here, but uh, if you have an interest in being on our board, let me know. It's going to take an expanded board to do what we're planning to do to implement this law. Okay, so this is the announcement from Ken. We are filming this to go into our website. There are legal complications in doing such recordings of your questions during the Q&A session. If you ask a question at this time, it will be interpreted as giving permission to be recorded. So if you don't want your face blasted all over the world, uh, <laughs> uh, don't get up and ask a question, I guess is the answer to that. Okay, our March meeting will be about Alzheimer's, which is the question everybody asks all the time which is our big concern. Um, so we're having medical directors, Mitz is assembling this panel as he always does, medical directors of, of memory care units to talk about what we can put in our advanced directives that will assure that treatment will stop when we want it to. This is a big question that we all have. We don't know how much our advanced directives are honored and we hope we'll find out from this um, collection of people. If you know anybody who runs an Alzheimer's unit or has anything to do with it, let us know and we'll invite them to participate in this panel. Really important meeting. And we're not finished with the subject of Alzheimer's, but this one about your advanced directive is very important. Um, copy of Mother Jones, My Right to Die. Has everybody seen this? <laughs> Thank you, Stu Robinson. Okay, so today's meeting on the end of life options law. First, we will hear from, well, first of all, I have to apologize because the notice we sent out said today's speaker from Washington will be Dr. Bob Wood. 
and he is a volunteer medical director for End of Life Washington. But unfortunately, he had back problems which prevented him from coming. But fortunately, we got Rob Miller. This is very exciting. Um, I've known Rob for years and years and years. He was the executive director of Compassion and Choices Washington for 15 years. Before the law passed, he helped the law pass, and then he helped the law become implemented in Washington. So he's going to tell how that works, and that's really important for us to know. And our other speaker is Stephanie Elkins from uh, Compassion and Choices, who has a very important title, which I can't remember offhand, and maybe she'll tell you. Sorry, Stephanie. <laughs> So we're all concerned about what CNC, the Compassion Choices, will do in the state of California. We have 39 million people here, who some of whom will want to use the law. How will that work? And how will Compassion be able to help us all uh, in implementing this law and using it? So with that, I'm going to start with Rob Miller, who will talk about 20 minutes, a uh, few minutes for Q&A, and then we'll go to Stephanie, a few minutes for Q&A, and then we'll open it up to the floor. So hopefully we'll be finished by 3 o'clock, and all your questions will be answered. No, that'll never happen. But okay. Rob. Thank you for the warm welcome. It's a pleasure to be here today to speak to you. I'm really very pleased about the passage of California's End of Life Options Act. Uh, it's obviously the largest state in the country with the largest population. It's a significant achievement. Um, and to have it, uh, have it be done through the legislature uh, is also pretty remarkable. Um, prior to the passage of the uh, Death with Dignity Act in Vermont, it was thought that no legislature would ever touch this issue or pass one of these laws. So uh, California made history uh, by becoming the second state to enact a medical aid in dying law through the legislative process. But like all legislation, which is then compared to making sausage, <laughs> um, there are some really great things that came out of the, um, the legislation, and then, then a few things that are maybe not, not so great uh, from, as compared to the Oregon and Washington Death with Dignity Acts. Now, most of you probably know this, but just a quick history lesson. Uh, the first um, attempt to pass uh, an aid in dying law was in 1991, I believe, in the state of Washington. It was called Initiative 119. And it allowed for aid in dying, which is the self-administration of life-ending medi life medication and euthanasia. So the administration of life-ending medication through an a injection or an IV. And it failed by 54% uh, to 46%. There was a massive influx of cash from the Catholic Church at the end of the campaign that essentially overwhelmed the uh, activists that were trying to pass the law. The good news about that was is that there were lessons learned. And in 1994, the Oregon Death with Dignity Act passed um, and was held up for a few years by machinations of a, a of a law until about 1997, I think it actually was enacted in 1998. So the passage of the first Death of Dignity Act in the United States was in the state of Oregon. And uh, since the passage of that, uh, the people, the folks working in Washington state uh, were planning to also pass an initiative uh, I came on board in the year 2000 as executive director. We started planning for the initiative campaign in 2005. Uh, we targeted the year 2008 because of Obama being on the ballot. We knew that would bring out the progressive vote. At the same time, there was also a very um, high profile anti-gay marriage campaign going on here in the state of California that diverted a lot of the opposition's money uh, 
um, to prevent gay marriage. So it was, I think gay marriage was considered the, uh, Aiden dying in Washington was considered the lesser of the two evils. And so we outspent the opposition in the state of Washington and we won with nearly 60% of the vote uh, in all but nine of Washington's 39 counties. Now that's significant because, like California, the coastal populations tend to be more liberal and progressive, and the population is much larger in coastal areas, and so the coastal areas tend to kind of carry the, the state when it comes to initiatives and, and uh, elections. Well, in Washington, we won in primarily Republican and uh, conservative counties, as well as the area that I call Pugetopolis, sort of the, the cities, the, the major metrop metropolitan areas around Puget Sound, like Seattle, Tacoma, Olympia, Bellingham, that tend to you know, vote very democratic and very liberal. So we were very pleased to, to have this sort of resounding in, um, support for the passage of the law. So one thing that's very important for all of you to understand is the passage of a law, either by initiative or by legislation, is just the end of the beginning. Right. Having a law does not mean that you can use it. Um, talk to women in Texas who want an abortion, for example. And so it's really important that there are organizations and individuals committed to ensuring that people have access to this law now that you have it on the books. And in Washington State, we were very fortunate because we had a long time grassroots organization that started out as the Hemlock Society of Washington State and then another organization called Compassion and Dying formed. And then in 2005, Compassion and Dying merged with what was Hemlock of Washington State to become Compassion and Choices of Washington. And so we had this large grassroots, well not large, it was just me and a part-time administrator. <laughs> but we had, a, we had a large base of support. Um, you know, for the organization um, in place before we, uh, you know, move forward with, with trying to pass the law. And then when the law passed, we had to ramp up. Um, we were already providing client support services to people before the passage of the law, educating them about their end-of-life choices, including the option of the self-administration administration of life ending medication, by the way, before the passage of the law. Um, but because the practice was still kind of in a gray area and medical providers were not uh, supportive in any way or um, accepting in any way, of course, because this wasn't considered a legal uh, practice or it was a very gray area to say the least. Um, we had about 12 client support volunteers, a volunteer client support team leader, and 1.5 full-time paid staff. So after the law passed, we had to ramp up, and at this time, the organization has 40 volunteers, client support volunteers, four volunteer medical directors, an executive director, an associate director whose job is essentially to raise money for the organization. Um, there is a social worker, a part-time social worker, who works about three quarters time to uh, coordinate all the efforts of the client support team members. And there's a full-time administrative assistant. And so, um, and we have a caseload of approximately 100 active clients and about 100 more who are currently inactive. And this is just in Washington. Now our population is a fraction of California's. Now one thing that we've learned since the enactment of the Death with Dignity Acts in Oregon and Washington is that only a minuscule percentage of the population uses the law. Now all of us, 
can be comforted by having the option. Uh, but when it comes right down to it, there's really only a select few people who, who go through the entire process and um, acquire the medication. And, and even those who acquire the medication, a significant percentage elect not to take the medication. They just want to have that medication there for peace of mind, sort of like insurance. And then there are always a few people who have a medical event or lose the capacity to make a, a decision, you know, become uh, incapacitated or maybe have a stroke or who deteriorate so rapidly that they simply, you know, can't swallow anymore. And so they lose the option to self-administer the medication. And one thing that's very important about all of these laws in the United States is that they're limited to permitting the self-administration of life-ending medication. No one can do it to you. It doesn't allow for lethal injection or an IV administration of the life-ending medication. It's something that you have to do, be able to do voluntarily and and you have to be mentally competent in order to qualify. And this is why people with Alzheimer's and forms of dementia don't qualify for the law. Because by the time a person with Alzheimer's has a prognosis of six months or less to live, which is required by virtually all the laws in Vermont, Oregon, Washington, and California, they're no longer competent. So it's not an option for people with certain neurological illnesses that result in the loss of the capacity to make a me an informed medical decision. And so the law does require the person to be mentally competent. So it's not a law that works for everybody under every situation. You cannot put in a living will that you want the option of the End of Life Options Act or the Oregon or Washington Death with Dignity Act. It doesn't work that way. Uh, you, um, it, uh, living will, of course, only takes effect when you can't speak for yourself, when you've lost the capacity to communicate your decisions. And if you've lost the capacity to communicate the decisions, you're no longer eligible for the option of Death with Dignity or um, End of Life Option Act here in California. So. Um, you know, understanding the law and how it works, I think, is very important for you as representatives of Hemlock of San Diego uh, to help communicate because even after seven years in Washington and um, 20, nearly 20 in, in Oregon, there are still even medical providers who have misconceptions about the law. Um, it's remarkable how many people don't even know that they have the option in Washington state. It's like, well, you know, we know that 80% of the population voted in 2008, and, you know, don't you have any idea what was on the ballot when you voted? <laughs> you know, that was kind of an important election, and it was an important issue. Anyway, it's surprising how many people don't, uh, are still unaware that the option exists. And so you, as, as people with inside information through your affiliation with Hemlock of San Diego, are going to be um, helping to educate your neighbors and families and friends about this law and, and what, it, what it does and doesn't do and how it works. So I thought it might be good to, to just go through you know, some of the, the basic uh, components of the law. Um, you have to make two oral requests to your attending physician, uh, separated by 15 days. And those requests have to be documented in the medical record. And you also have to submit a written request that's witnessed by two people. And there are some limits on you know, who the witnesses can and can't be. And you have to submit that. And then 48 hours before you intend to take the medication, you have to submit another request. I think it's referred to as an affidavit or something like that. It's a, attestation. Uh, right, an attestation form uh, to say that you, are, you intend to take the medication. Now these are, no. um, you know, it sounds, uh, I know it sounds a little burdensome, but um, it's, it's uh, if you're determined and uh, you have 
some assistance from um, <coughs> providers like um, the client support volunteers at uh, Compassion and Choices of Washington or Compassion and <coughs> Choices or possibly volunteers that end up um, volunteering through Hemlock of San Diego, you can get through the process. It's not too burdensome. The key is to not wait until you're at death's door. And many people, um, you know, not any of you, uh, but the general population typically wait, uh, many people uh, typically wait too long to be in pre preparing for the end of life. They don't make advanced directives, they don't have conversations with their family members, and then they end up in a coma or have a stroke and nobody knows what they want and um, it's a, you know, it turns into a complete mess with uh, families, members fighting among one another and now all of you have advanced directives and have had conversations with your families about what you want and don't want, but you're the exception. So the law um, <coughs> requires uh, either those steps and but before you can get the medication and then you know after the medication it's my understanding that even with the attestation form that there's really no way for the state to ensure that you're taking the medication in 48 hours if you don't take the medication no one's going to come take it away from you you can continue to have it <clears throat> so now the medication itself um, there's been some controversy around the medication and the cost of the medication. The optical medication is a class of drugs called uh, short-acting barbiturates. And the two drugs in that class are called pentobarbital and secobarbital. And you may have heard of secanol or secanol. Uh, that's, that's a brand name. And nebutol is a brand name. That's a form of, of um, of pentobarbital that's actually injectable. And it's so so very expensive that it's completely out of reach for the purpose of the End of Life Options Act or Death with Dignity. The cost of for enough nembutol, which which is a liquid, would be between ten and twenty thousand dollars. Now um, second all is readily available. It uh, was manufactured by a company in the, in the U.S. called Marathon, and then Marathon sold the manufacturing rights to an organization, um, to a company in Canada called Valiant. Unfortunately, the cost of second all was pretty expensive when Marathon was manufacturing it. It was about 20, I'd say 2200, 1800 to 2200 for the cost of the second all. When Valiant acquired the manufacturing rights, the cost nearly doubled. So it cost between $3,500 and $5,000 for the 100 capsules of second all necessary um, to follow the recommended protocol for ending one's life. In Washington, after the price rise in second all, a group of physicians, pharmacists, toxicologists um, got together and came up with a new protocol that uses a combination of medications um, that costs about $500 and, and come, has to be um, compounded at a compounding pharmacy. So this isn't something that you can go to your, you know, your local pharmacy and pick up. It has to come from a compounding pharmacy. The only downside with this new protocol, we've had about 56 people use the new protocol and we've had 56 successes. Nobody's recovered from um, an attempt to, uh, to end their life with, with a new protocol. The only downside is that it, uh, it can create a very burning sensation when it's swallowed. Now, the uh, second all is, has a terrible taste too, so it's uh, it's not like you know going from you know a milkshake to something that tastes terrible. It's they both taste bad, but but the the uh, chloral hydrate protocol is um, particularly um, can be difficult to swallow. But we're working on that. We're looking at the possibility of having people gargle with with lidocaine solution or something to to. Uh, to eliminate that burning sensation that occurs. So 
you will have the benefit of all this knowledge that's been compiled in Oregon and Washington for all these years, including this new protocol at $500. And one of the wonderful things about your California End of Life Options Act is that it permits the transmission of a prescription for life-ending medication electronically. In Washington, the prescription has to be hand-delivered or mailed. It can't be faxed. So it can be transmitted electronically, and more importantly, the prescription can be FedExed or mailed in a, in a, as long as it's um, signature required from a pharmacy to directly to a patient. So you could have a single go-to pharmacy in the state of California for all prescriptions of life-ending medication. And actually, I think it will turn out that there are probably going to be just like a couple of pharmacies that are sort of the ones that, that either maintain supplies of second all or a compounding pharmacy or two that specialize in putting together this oral hydrate um, uh, protocol and mailing that. So that's going to be much, much easier um, for patients to acquire the medication here and for physicians to um, find participating pharmacies. Because pharmacies, just like physicians, have the right not to participate in the law. The law is very specific about allowing individual practitioners, psychologists, psychiatrists, physicians, pharmacists, to opt out. They don't have to tell you why. Can talk. Okay. Um, they don't have to tell you why, they can just opt out, and whole systems can opt out of participation. And so um, it'll be important to have, to have a guidance in place in order to help you find participating physicians uh, and participating pharmacists. But the issue of pharmacists is much alleviated by this this provision of the law. So um, I'm going to wrap things up, but in Washington State, um, our affiliate last year uh, helped about 96% of the people who use the Washington Death with Dignity Act in some capacity. That could mean just helping them find a physician or both physicians or a pharmacist, or that our volunteers were present at the time of death, because that is one of the services we offer. Um, uh, the client support services we offer, and the significant number of our clients take us up on that offer in order to uh, have the assurance of knowing that they're following the protocol properly and just so that they can be there for their loved one emotionally and not be looking at their watch and saying, now it's time to take the medication to keep you, know, keep you from becoming nauseous, et cetera. So it's working very well in Washington. It's not without challenges. Um, religiously affiliated providers are not supportive. They'll prohibit their physicians from participating, their pharmacies from participating. Hospice is a challenge. There are some hospices that are very squeamish about the Death with Dignity Act, about their hospice patients who are using it, and some of them will prohibit their nurses from being present at the time of death or um, even limit. In some cases, there are gag rules around even talking about the option of death with dignity. So there are challenges, but uh, the law is working extremely well. And um, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Yes, sir. Uh, you talked about the liberal western side of your state. What about Spokane and that area? How do they vote? Uh, the question was, um, I had talked about the western side of Washington being the kind of the liberal enclave, and how did Spokane vote? Well, we won in Spokane County. Is the eastern side of Washington much more conservative than the western side? Yes, oh. so Washington is a state where there's a mountain range that called the Cascades, right. and everything to the west of the Cascades is considered the west, east, the west coast east, and everything to the 
to the east is typically more re Republican and conservative. The gentleman that was here from Oregon, talk, I think he believed he said it took a little while for the hospice to get on board, but in Oregon they're all on board now. He said. Oh, I know, I right. wish. <laughs> well, um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't go so far as to say they're all on board. I mean, there are uh, policies kind of run the gamut with hospice. You know, some are completely unsupportive. Some will even allow their medical directors to write prescriptions for people. And so it runs, runs the gamut. But uh, we'll have more time for questions later. I'm going to pass the mic on to Stephanie now, and uh, we'll have plenty of time for questions later. Thank Thanks. you. Be here. Um, pleasure to share the, the panel, the stage with the Bay. Thank you so much uh, for all your work over the years and um, on, on this on this issue, this and being a leader in that. And uh, Rob, beautifully, you know, thank you for this great introduction. So I might just kind of reinforce some of what Rob <laughs> shared, um, and kind of my my role here today is to kind of tell you a little bit about. Uh, compassionate choices, uh, my role, um, some more of the criteria of the California End of Life Options Act, and then kind of really go into detail of what, how we're going to be rolling the implementation out, how you can be of support, um, and, and so on. So that's kind of what I'm here to do. So um, my role, it, uh, it, my, my uh, fancy title, uh, is uh, California Medical Outreach Organizer. Um, it actually had, um, it was before as California Medical Outright Outreach and Organizing Manager. But we can take out the organizing now, because as you know, the California End of Life Option Act did pass. Uh, the Governor Brown signed it on um, October 5th of last year. So we're crossing that out, so my title shrunk. It's still kind of fancy, I like it, but it's shrunk, because we don't need to organize anymore about it. Um, so that's, that's wonderful. Um, and and uh, Compassion and Choices is a free resource and support center for, um, uh, actually that was my last job. Uh, we, uh, my job before this was running uh, a free resource and support center for family caregivers, so that's kind of how where I come to this and really being an educator. Compassion and Choices uh, is a nonprofit to improve care and options at end of life, um, which all of you I know are passionate about for yourselves and your community as well. Um, we do that through uh, education, support, and advocacy. So we were the central like, um, organization behind the bill itself and kind of helped um, build that bill and had grassroots efforts. And Ken Fossil, who's here, and Lynn, I know we, and uh, has been involved um, in campaigning and doing some of the grassroots efforts, which I know a lot of you have been uh, involved in as well. Um, and I have, so that's kind of where, where we're at. Um, just to, I know you know a lot of this, but in terms of end of life options that are available right now, um, we have unwanted medical treatment that you can talk about. We have palliative sedation. Um, there's VSED, about a voluntary stopping eating and drinking, and I know that uh, some of you might be well educated on that. There's also more information to back, the little bit more details on that. Now we also have the California End of Life Option Act. And we do have end of life consultants, uh, the 800 line, and volunteers to talk about all those options with individuals and how to talk with families. And so we have that kind of base of support um, available for individuals when they just need a little more information and details on that. So, what is the criteria for the end of life option act? And we also have some materials on that as well. You have to be an adult, right? 18 and older. You have to be a California resident. And it's really detailed in the bill of what it means to be a California resident. It's not the amount of months that you live here. It's kind of um, certain identification requirements, and that's also on the information in the back. So people are like, how long do you have to live? And it's, it's more about what, what uh, materials you have that can show, authorize your residency in California. You have to uh, have a terminal diagnosis with a prognosis of six months or less. Um, kind of goes parallel with what the hospice requirements are right now. So that kind of goes along with that. Now with that diagnosis, oh, so there's their terminally illness. And then there's the, um, the capacity to make medical, uh, medical health care decisions for yourself. 
okay? Um, and to be able to self-administer, which we kind of talked about as well. So those are the basic criteria, uh, the four, you know, four or five criteria you need to be eligible, okay? Now, as we were mentioned, this is a process, um, and, a, a, and, and for those that are determined and, and to go through it, you need, once again, the two oral requests and one written. So you need two doctors to agree on those criteria. What also those doctors review, have to review with you are all the feasible alternatives that are available for you. So that conversation that people are afraid is not going to happen, happens. And in Oregon and Washington, the use of hospice and individuals that ask or get the prescription, in, in Oregon it's like over 90% of individuals that get the prescription or ask for it are on hospice. So we've seen that there is more detailed conversation. So doctors are required, it's on the checklist that they have to send in, that they have the conversation regarding other treatment options. If, um, if they, if they feel that there is a capacity issue, a mental capacity issue, due to some sort of uh, a mental disorder, then they have to refer them to a mental health specialist, which is a psychiatrist uh, or a clinical uh, psychologist. So, if, so that's also in the law, if there's that. Um, one of the things we also mentioned is that it's, it's voluntary. So, and there's the, the idea in Oregon and Washington, the idea of being coerced, that, that idea of coercion has not happened. It just hasn't happened. Um, and so it's voluntary for the individual, it's voluntary for the doctors involved, and also the healthcare <coughs> systems. Now what healthcare systems have to do, if they're not supportive of this policy, of this uh, law, then they have to have that in writing. Okay, we'll get to that a little bit later. So, those that aren't supportive have to have, they have to have it in writing. So those are the kind of other ideas for um, for some of the checklist that the, you know that's written in the policy. So what are we doing? Because as we said, this is a process, and um, one of the things that Compassion and Choices in my role now is is we we created a California Access campaign. And that's really to make sure that people have access. And what you need to do is do massive work in the community and the healthcare, community healthcare systems, so people have access. And that's really where we are. We've created a bilingual hotline so people can stay updated on, on the campaign and the requirements and so on. Like what I uh, didn't mention as a, as a law passed, but the effective date is not there's no effective date yet. So I just wanted to scoot back for a little bit and just make you aware that the law was passed, but it was passed in what's called a special session, which is totally legal, very strategic, but a very legal way to pass a bill in this special session. That special session is not closed yet, okay? So once the special session closes, the 90 days after that, the law will be uh, effective. So this way, we're like, we're, we're having these conversations, which is great, because we need to get out there and do some education. We're thinking that it's between April 2016 and January 2017 that the effective date we're having. But we're thinking it's going to be in summertime. So to give you a sense of summertime is really what we're looking at for this uh, bill to be effective. So that's the date when thinking about it. It doesn't mean it's too early to talk to doctors at all <laughs> or your family members, um, but that's when, when it goes into effect. So what are we doing? What's this access campaign? Um, uh, what does it include? One is about community outreach. It's about educating yourself and your own health care providers. It's about individuals um, being um, change agents in this. Because that's where we really feel it happens, to make aid and dying part of the normal conversation of end-of-life planning. So it starts when you get infiltrate with individuals talking to their own doctors. So, so that's one of our first goals. Our others is educating the community like you guys do so beautifully, is going out to senior centers and uh, um, 
other uh, uh, organizations uh, to, to educate, other Rotary Clubs, other social clubs. Um, we have actually an action team here in San Diego that Ken and uh, Dr. Tamita are co-leaders of. And we're actually going to be doing an educational event to train individuals to go out and to talk at other groups. So if that's something that you're really interested in, we're going to have a training on that. I have some materials. Um, so you can meet uh, my other colleague, Joe, who's in charge of the community outreach piece and getting individuals to really start those conversations with their doctors. One of the other pieces are like, well, how do I start talking to my doctor? Well, I know that in your, la your newsletter that you haven't received yet, right? They, it's, uh, yes, they've received it. <laughs> they've received it, you've received it. I, there's a great layout of how to start having these conversations with your doctor. So you have that material, so you don't have to, we are going to have it on our website, which is endoflifeoption.org, but I know you already have some good tools. So you have that, how to start that conversation. Now, I wouldn't say if they're like, some doctors are fearful of this. You know, depending on their response, doesn't mean you have to go find somebody else right away. It's more of a, I don't, you know, if there's more fear involved in it, if there's more, questions of, of they're not sure, then there's information to provide them. Um, we have a doc-to-doc -doc hotline, so they can talk directly to doctors. We have this um, toll-free line so we get, get more information. So that's available. So I would just encourage that ongoing conversation. Now, if they say, oh, my hospital system, there's a policy out that we don't, why don't you just grab it and send it to the or me so we can see what it's about, we have it on record, okay? So if it's, if it's a healthcare system thing, and, and really, um, which they need a policy in writing, like I said, you know, they, that needs to be on record. So that's something to find out and say, oh, can I, you know, to really, maybe it's not them just covering for themselves because they're not sure, but it's, it's, it's legitimate. And we know with Catholic hospitals, that might be the case. So there's information on how to have those conversations. What I'm working on with, with uh, Dr. Tamita, is really reaching out to the healthcare systems. You know, the idea is really to um, educate and encourage policies that are supportive of aid and dying. So that's where our main focus is, is really to um, do CEUs and uh, talk to hospices about their own policies, where they stand, and hopefully be able to fit into the certain gaps. So what's happened, and in, in, in what Rob was sharing, that there, there are hospice um, workers that are not comfortable with this for religion, religious re reasons or whatever, and they're like, you know, that's okay, it's voluntary. But, but Rob has part of his talk and friends with those, those hospice workers that have to step out of the room when somebody uses the aid and dying medication. Now that's the healthcare professional that is used to being with people and given medications for palliative sedation or, and they have to step out of the room at the special time in someone's life. And we're saying, well, you guys have to figure out how that looks a little different because we're not gonna guarantee like in Washington that we have a volunteer that's gonna be by your side. We will. <laughs> that's something down the road in San Diego what you do. So that's kind of the area we're really going to be encouraging and we have volunteers that potentially could do that that, that, that at this time are able to be but um, with our end of life consultants and volunteers um, we do like I said before provide education and support and uh, in some instances be present for those at that time but in terms of, of just the sheer volume. So, you know, Lynn's been involved, she's involved with you, she's also involved with the boss volunteering with us. So I don't want to say it's not gonna happen, but just the sheer volume of that. Right. So so that's where we stand. But really what and, and Rob was saying, like this is good luck <laughs> in changing this the structure of a system of of really encouraging uh, it, hospices to have different um, policies and state for their employees to kind of be present at that time. We don't want to abandon, that's not our, our what we're going for. It's about creating systems that are going to be stuck up to the plate because they are already have that medical background and they're already present. So that's kind of what we are encouraging. Um, one of the things that's also really exciting 
is that there are medical organizations that have already taken lead, even if the effective have been proactive in starting these conversations with members. So the CHA, the California Hospital Association, already had a webinar um, and great information um, on training hospitals, well, educating hospitals of like, hey, this is the law, this is where you need to kind of check into it with your, create for your own policies and your own organizations. There's CHAPCA, which is the California Hospital and Palliative Care Association. They've, they've already hosted one conference. They have two webinars coming up, which was a colleague of, of Rob's and uh, the Hospice and Palliative Care Association in Washington that's overseen those conversations. And then we also have the California Academy of Family Physicians that's doing a webinar. So there's already, which is really exciting, that they're being proactive and saying, hey, we need to be ahead of this and let people know that they really need to be thoughtful and mindful because these are all huge conversations uh, to be had, um, especially around palliative care uh, doctors and so on. So we're really, and we're really happy to hear that they're moving forward in this direction and, and um, educating their own members to be thoughtful about creating policies. We are looking to definitely stay tuned of, of healthcare systems that are supportive and that's something that we're gonna share and do. We're not gonna be a directory for individual doctors. That's not um, in, in our role right now, but we will continue to educate and let people know what's available. So healthcare systems is the largest way to go ahead and do that. So that's kind of our model of doing education and outreach to, um, to uh, for community members, first for yourself with your own doctor, right? We need to model everything we do. Um, then to other organizations, and for me, to different healthcare associations. Like I'm doing a hospice presentation tomorrow. I don't know where their policy is gonna stand, so I'm not gonna be like, okay, they're on board. But um, there is organizations that are calling up and um, wanting to better educate um, their, um, their employees. So that's really exciting. So that's kind of where I'm going to keep it right now. Um, and, and thank you for your time. I'm open to questions and, and, and so on for both of us. OK, questions. And if you ask a question, you'll be on national television here. No. <laughs> Bert. Uh, Bert always has the first question. <laughs> Make it short. <laughs> One of our wonderful hospice physicians here at San Diego with Sharp Healthcare, Dr. Elizondo, said to me he had a conversation. Uh -huh. She wouldn't ask any primary care physician anything about death and dying if he didn't have training. She, she won't come here and speak either. She won't. Why? Because we're a headline. Oh. Sorry. I, I love her, but yeah, she won't come. But I mean, she said that, that she said at a forum we had, she said that she would not rely on any primary care. And I know primary care physicians also have the problem of, of sending people to hospice too late. Well, we're looking to, to shift that conversation because more individuals are going to be asking and talking about it. And, um, you know, a lot of the doctors um, in Oregon, you know, some of our national medical directors are family care physicians. Um, they have the relationship with the individuals and they're thoughtful and mindful and it's, it's part of the medical care that they talk about capacity and so on. So it's about prognosis and capacity. So that's it's, really it's very important that the doctors know that there's a groundswell for this. So start talking to your doctor now, primary care specialist, whatever. Tell that doctor that you are interested, you want to know in advance whether that doctor is going to yeah. cooperate with this law or not. And, and you know, there's And there's, you'll go elsewhere if not. Yeah. And positions have changed you know, over time. Care face for that kind of conversation yeah. with your doctor. Yes, um, very good point. Now Medicare pays for that conversation with your doctor. The uh, death panel conversation. <laughs> so I need to, to qualify that. Um, you probably all do remember how that provision was stripped out of the Affordable Care Act um, by the very successful and well-framed death panel campaign. Um, but um, that provision of uh, coverage in Medicare was recently reestablished by rule, but what it permits is a primary care physician to have a conversation with a patient about advanced planning. So it's limited to a discussion about making a living will and naming a, a legal surrogate 
um, to, to make health care decisions. It won't directly uh, reimburse for um, discussions around the use of the California End of Life Options Act. Now, most of the physicians will end up getting reimbursed for those appointments because they will simply um, code them as a follow-up appointment with somebody. And that's how it's worked out in, in Washington. And to get back to the, the gentleman who asked the first question, his point, um, we have many people come to us, to our organization. They're referred to us because they're a provider. They're primary care physician or their oncologist or neurologist has said, no, I won't participate in the law. It's not something that I believe in for professional, spiritual, religious, philosophical, whatever the reasons are. Um, but fortunately, many of them are at least referring them, their patients on to end of life Washington. And in those situations, often, one of our medical directors will contact that physician and try to persuade her or him to change his mind or change her mind about participating in the law or say, well, if you're not willing to write the prescription, will you be the consulting physician, the physician that simply has to confirm the patient's prognosis and diagnosis and mental capacity? And then often we can get a physician to work as a consulting physician, and then after they've been the consulting physician, they might step up and become the prescribing physician. So um, no doesn't always mean no, I guess is, uh, is what I'm saying. And that it's important for you as consumers to express how important it is to you that you have your physician support for this choice. And now that this is a legal option in California, it behooves you to say to your physician using appropriate language, um, such as, if I were at the very end of my life, and we all knew, we all understood that I was in the dying phase of my illness, it would give me great comfort to know that I could use the California End of Life Options Act. Would you be willing to prescribe life-ending medication under the law for me under those circumstances? You know, I'm somebody who believes in quality of life over quantity of life. I've had a very long-held belief around this issue that a person should have this choice. And ask the question, will you be willing to prescribe. Now, if the physician says to you, well, let's talk about it when the time comes, that is a bad omen. That's, that means I don't want to talk about it. If they say that, look at the little bubble over their head with a caption that says, I don't want to talk about it. Yeah. Okay. Now, now, notice the language that I didn't use. I would like you to help me kill myself. <laughs> You know, I want to commit suicide if I'm, you know. So it's important to frame the question in a way that expresses that what you're asking for is comfort, comfort, peace of mind, palliation. That's really important. Um, so frame the question in a way that makes it easier for the physician to be supportive of your choice. You're not asking for traditional palliative care, though. Well, no, you're not asking for traditional palliative no, care. And, and you, may get, you may get offered, and, and indeed you should be offered palliative care. We should all have access to excellent end-of-life care, which includes palliative care and hospice. I mean, frankly, at End of Life Washington, if we get a, a client that isn't on hospice, that's one of the first things that we do is say, you need to be on hospice, and one of the main reasons you need to be on hospice is because you want to stay at home. Because if you move to an institution, your right to use the law can be compromised. Because institutions can prohibit you from administering the medication on their premises. So 
there's an important reason for hospice. The other reason is that because after a death, if you're on hospice, it's very simple. The hospice notifies the medical director, and the medical director um, or the medical examiner issues this um, um, sort of certification that allows your body to be removed. If you're not on hospice, then there's going to be a call made to 911. And, and also, it simplifies the job of the two doctors to say that you have uh, six months to live. Right, exactly. So, you know, if you're on hospice, you're you know, generally eligible for the, you know, for the End of Life Options Act. Um, this was a long-winded answer, I'm sorry. It's important. <laughs> yeah, uh, Julie, Julie. Just one line. Oh, wait a minute. Who am I talking to? Can you repeat that question, please? I can't. I, 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 you? Okay, yes, you. Yeah, <laughs> behind you. <laughs> I'm just Levante. It's my first meeting. I used to be a spiritual care coordinator with uh, Sharp Hospice Care. So I've retired uh, from that job. And, well, I might as well say, I, I always felt uh, ill at ease with hospice refusal to accept uh, Hemlock Society. So I'm, I'm kind of free now. <laughs> uh, one of the approach that I haven't heard much is the ethical principle that of, of self-determination, that it's a person's right uh, um, and that we should respect a person's will on, on their own life. I like the word dignity more than end of life option, or, but, but we'll work with that vocabulary that we have. Uh, one question I have, does the second, the consulting doctor, does he need to see the patient or is a review of the chart sufficient? Okay, I'm going to just ask the question that um, these two speakers will answer. But as far as the ethics of self-determination, it sounds good, but it all has to be embedded in the law. Yeah. So uh, I could, in the next half hour, give you the history of how the law has changed in the United States and in California to provide more self-determination. And we keep pushing the envelope the public does, to get increasing amounts of self-determination. I personally think this law is too restrictive, and I would like to see it expanded to non-terminal people, and et cetera, and, and also with an injection. So uh, self-determination is sounds good, but it does require legal change to make it effective. Now, the question was, um, you got the question, did you? <laughs> yeah, the, the question was, does the consulting physician need to examine the yeah. patient? And yes, yeah. mm -hmm. there needs to be a face-to-face -face examination of the patient. Uh, so that physician will likely have access, will almost always have access to the medical records uh, from the attending or prescribing physician and will review the record and examine the patient. They're required by law to determine, make some of the same determinations as the prescribing physician. The diagnosis, the prognosis of six months or less, an adult, a California resident, um, the mental capacity to make an informed decision about health care. To, to get back to your, your other issue is, you know, when you talk about dignity and self-determination, the medical term for that is autonomy. Yeah. And autonomy, the principle of autonomy has actually been growing within the medical system over the last several decades. Years ago, the, you know, the doctor was sort of the, the patriarch. You know, um, the people yeah. in my parents' generation, my mother, for instance, who's 95, thinks that, you know, her doctor walks on water. You know, but baby boomers don't feel that way. When baby boomers are pushing 70 years old. They're people who have generally, you know, questioned authority, um, you know, gone their own way in life, had strong beliefs about autonomy, about self-determination. And so we are not going to go quietly into that, um, into that dark night. We're going to be questioning our providers and arguing with them and saying, hey, I'm entitled to not be in pain. Um, but so the principle of autonomy has been growing stronger over time. Um, but self-determination is not in the law. 
It is not part of the Oregon or Washington Death with Dignity Acts. We often refer to it as, you know, sort of self-determination, but it really is a very limited um, form of autonomy under certain circumstances. You have the right to acquire life and medication under these certain circumstances, these limited Limit. circumstances. And this is as far as the American population is willing to go. Now, in some yeah. countries, Belgium, Luxembourg, the, the Netherlands, euthanasia is legal. Euthanasia is legal in the United States only for people who don't want it. It's capital punishment. <laughs> but, but voluntary euthanasia will not be legal in any of our lifetimes mm -hmm. in this country. Funny note about this is that. But could we go to the next? Uh, yeah. There was um, Judy. Um, so I remember reading, uh, obviously, some of the concerns about passing the law involved it not truly being voluntary. And I think I also read, you know, that, that it would be used by people because their families or others are sort of encouraging them. Um, and I re thought I remember reading that, that one of the safeguards was for one of the physicians to have a specific conversation with the patient. Oh, thank you, yeah. Uh, Independent. Okay. Yeah, so, so thank you for adding that. That is one of the criteria when you look at the checklist is that the, in, so coercion just hasn't, ha I mean, there has, that is a fear-based response right. to the what ifs. We, we've right. seen from over 30 years of experience to get, that it hasn't happened. But the idea that the um, um, attending physician has to have an independent conversation with the individual about about it. You're right. So that is written into the law and part of the checklist. So thank so you for that. Yeah, the attending physician. The attending physician, physician, and that conversation has to occur without any other family yeah, members. Yeah, that's an independent, present. yeah. So that's, that's specifically yeah. within the law. And, yeah. To address your, the, the issue of coercion, um, this is one of the favorite um, tropes of the anti-choice um, activists. The idea that frail, elderly, poor, uninsured, uh, minority, people with disabilities will somehow be steered into ending their own lives as a form of eugenics, if you will. And of course, you know, in the extreme cases, when I was debating opponents in, uh, in Washington State, I was referred to as a Nazi, which is particularly <laughs> offensive to me as the son of a Jewish man who's whose grandfather was a Holocaust uh, a victim. So, um, you know, the coercion is part of the fear-based campaign against the movement for end-of-life choice. Mm -hmm. Now, we have 25 years of data yeah. in Oregon and Washington that indicate that nobody has ever been coerced into swallowing this terrible tasting, <laughs> Um, you know, slurry of, of life-ending medication. You can't be tricked into it. It can't happen in your sleep. Um, you have to be pretty determined and fairly persuasive in order to actually get through the process. Um, and so, you know, one of the best questions that I ever heard from a journalist during a debate was during an editorial board meeting, a public editorial board meeting in the city of Spokane, the Spokane Review. And the journalist asked one of the people representing the opposition, he said, you know, the Oregon law has been in effect since 1998, it took effect, it was passed in the second time in 1997, took effect in, I believe, 1998. He said, in all these years, don't you think we would have had some idea, some claim, one criminal case, one civil case, one situation, one report from a chaplain or a spiritual advisor or a nurse or social worker or doctor or police officer, just one. Can you give me one example of 
one of these so-called abuses that you claim will occur if the law has passed. Nothing. There is nothing. There is simply no evidence that these fear-based claims made by opponents to laws like Oregon, Washington's, Vermont's, and uh, now California's have occurred in 25 years. Yeah. But people are being coerced to stay alive. And that, to me, is yeah. a terrible yeah. abuse, yeah. which we're trying to correct. Yeah. Do you want to call on the next one? Who do you want to call on? It's your call. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Uh, Betty? Do you have to have a particular attending physician? Do you have to pick that physician out and find out whether or not they are willing to be an attending physician? You start with your own doctor. Oh, yeah. Do you have to have a particular attending physician? You have to pick this person out. I'm, I am a member of a health plan that's an HMO. And I'm wondering whether or not that HMO is going to come up with a policy for all of their physicians, or how are they going to handle it, and how would you, how would you suggest I found out what their policy is going to be. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, there were two questions. One is, does the attending physician have to be a particular physician, like your doctor, the primary right. care provider right. you've had for decades? Right. The answer is no. If that provider declines to participate, you can find a new physician. Within the HMO. Hopefully. Hopefully. Um, <laughs> hopefully. Um, Unless that system but, but that new physician simply becomes your attending physician. So the law sort of hints at the fact that it's supposed to be the doctor that you've been working with for, you know, ideally, though. ideally for decades who knows you. But the fact is, we know that many physicians will opt out of participation, even if they're permitted by their employers to participate, they'll opt out. And so ideally, they will refer you to a colleague or someone else or an organization. Yeah, the referrals necessary, you know, yeah. Um, to help you find another physician. Now, in terms of your HMO and its policies, virtually every health system will adopt a policy on the Death and Dignity Act for its employed staff, including its physicians, social workers, nurses, hospice nurses. They will, they will all adopt policies on what they are and aren't permitted to do. The religiously affiliated ones will pretty much have a blanket non-participation policy. And they will, um, you know, they will even um, attempt to stymie um, referrals and re resources that physicians can provide. Um, others, uh, you know, will um, will have policies that are more liberal. They will say that, okay, our physicians can participate as a consulting physician, but not a prescribing physician. Or our hospice nurses can refer patients to Compassion and Choices or Hemlock of San Diego, um, but they aren't allowed to um, participate in the law. And these policies will be all over the map. And in terms of finding out that's you know, you have to pressure time, the system okay. That's what we're talking to about. get the information. Yeah. So I just want to um, add, add on to that. Um, so that's why it comes down to the individual talking, you know, to your own doctor to find out. Uh, to give you an update on Kaiser, because uh, yeah, like, you're like, <laughs> I'm like, let me guess. Uh, yeah, that could, yeah. So Kaiser has been really supportive of this in Oregon and Washington. So they've been proactive leaders uh, on this. Um, I know Kaiser North and Kaiser South have already started working groups. So they oversee the different uh, North and South. So they're on it. They're they're doing education, and I've been asked to talk to one of the one of the medical social workers. Said I want to train my individuals before I don't even know the policy, but they want to still be educated on kind of like what I'm doing here for you, the overview of the criteria. But it's really the healthcare systems and hospices that really have to figure out what their own policy. But Kaiser's on it, so uh, I don't know the timing of that. You know, this is like a process. You know, it's a large. Okay. Um, I also wanted to. Um, just acknowledge um, 
uh, I think Ken and Dr. Tamita that have been involved with on the campaign and with the action team and also Mecha and Lynn who have also been involved. You raise your for, hands everybody, Ken. Mitch. And Larry is raising his hand. Mitch. Involved in. But um, um, in terms of, of the work we're doing moving forward uh, with Ken and Mitz in terms of the education and outreach, and Lynn and Mecha have been um, end of life uh, uh, consultant volunteers um, and have really been present with families. And that, like I said, that will continue to grow across the street and education training on that with whatever hemlocks that Society of San Diego tends to do too. I know they have some great ideas moving forward how to be present for individuals at end of life as well. So I just wanted to acknowledge, uh, acknowledge you. Thank you. Uh, me? <laughs> yeah, you do. Yeah. 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 That's That was the question yeah. I had too. Uh, but specifically, um, Kaiser as, a, as a, a corporation, they have a a liberal policy generally. They, do they leave it up to the individual physicians to uh, to, to uh, implement this law or not? Can they opt? Can the individual you know, That's still to be determined. I, we can talk about how, how it's worked and what. How do we know? That's not, well, one thing, I'll have for all share about what's going on in, in Washington, but that had, that's still playing out here in California. We get that Oregon and Washington might have different policies. Now, once again, individual doctors could still, it's voluntary for the doctors as well. So you still might even have to do some education internally with them to get them up to speed. So, you know, that's your role to be an advocate for yourself. Yeah, individual physicians do have the right to opt out no matter what the position, no matter how supportive their employers are. Mm. So they have the right to opt out of pharmacists, physicians, and psychological evaluation providers are all considered participating providers under the law. And so they all have the right to say, I'm not going to participate. And they aren't required to tell you why they, why not, or refer you uh, to, to another physician or even provide information. The law pretty much gives them carte blanche to not help you at all. One of the nice things about the Oregon law is that the law prohibits providers from withholding information from patients who make a direct ask. California. Yeah, California. California. Yeah. It's, it's part of the right to, right to care, yeah. Right, so you have, if you ask for information about the California End of Life Options so Act, they need to give you, resources. you have the right, that physician has the right, in fact, sort of a duty under the law. Well, not a duty. I mean, an ethical duty, but at least he or she has the right to give you that information no matter what the position of their employer. That's, that's something we don't have in Washington and Oregon. Do you want to talk about the Kaiser Washington model? Do you want to yeah, so in, in Kaiser in Washington, they have actually a dedicated social worker. So when a patient makes a request for the option of death with dignity or an inquiry about death with dignity, that is forwarded to this dedicated social worker who then contacts the patient and works with the patient through Kaiser's system to help them find the two participating physicians that they need to use the law. So the best systems, um, like the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance, Group Health, which is an HMO also in Seattle, and Kaiser, well actually Group Health is gonna be taken over by Kaiser soon, um, are are systems that generally have someone in the social work department dedicated to helping advocate for the patient through the process, hold the hold patient's that, yes. hand uh, through the process. Now the one thing they, they rarely uh, will do is to be present at the time of death, which is sort of a niche that our organization in Washington helps provide. Question over here, very interesting, yes, yeah. stand up. Um, if somebody elects the self-administration of the drugs and is successful, how is the cause of death reported on the death certificate? Uh, the, so the question was, is if someone uses the California End of Life Options Act and the Death with Dignity Acts in Oregon, Washington, and Vermont, how, what is the cause of death on the death certificate? The cause of death is, by law, the underlying illness. And it's the same reason that using 
the End of Life Options Act or self-administering life-ending medication has no effect on insurance or life insurance. Mm -hmm. So, and it's very clear and clearly written into the law that ending one's life under the law is not suicide. So this is part of, um, you know, part of the movement to differentiate between suicide and ending one's life when one is terminally ill and it's a question of not if but when, right? And so many professional organizations have now adopted position statements that there is a difference between the mentally competent choice of a terminally ill person with a very short lifespan to end his or her life and the irrational act of someone who's clinically depressed or mentally ill, um, you know, jumping off a bridge or you know, blowing his brains out. There is a difference. And we've been very, um, uh, the law reflects that difference by saying this is not suicide, the cause of death is not suicide, and suicide cannot be um, used as a reason to deny benefits under life insurance. Larry, you had a question? <laughs> this process, when, when can you start the process of getting the doctors to uh, uh, sign the thing that you get permission to uh, uh, get the drugs? In other words, you're pretty sick at six months left to live. Uh, is that when you have to start? So, first month, yeah. um, so the question is, is you know, really comes down to when. When do you start and when do you really become eligible for the... And, and do the process. For the process. So my, our advice at End of Life Washington is to start the dialogue um, with your primary care physician now. Mm -hmm. Regardless. Regardless of whether you have a terminal diagnosis or not. If or when you do get a terminal diagnosis, um, that is the time to begin the process. Now, the physician cannot formally um, start the process until you have a prognosis of six months or less to live. The two physicians have to agree, the attending, prescription, or attending physician and the consulting physician must agree that you have a prognosis of six months or less to live. That's when you can actually start the process. You can make your first oral request on the day that you are told that your physician thinks that you have six or months less to live. And that's when I would start, is as soon as I heard that I um, you know, had six months or less to live. Most, many people are in fairly good shape at six months. I've known people that took a cruise while they were you know, uh, on hospice. Uh, so, you know, it depends a lot on the illness and the symptoms you're experiencing. I just want to reiterate there is that 30 day, you know, period between the, the requests. So you kind of have to keep that in mind in terms of when you start the process. There is, it's not like you can ask for the medication and get right, you know, get it right away. It's that 30 days between the 30 days, 15 days. Oh, excuse me, 15 days. 15 days, sorry, my apologies. Oh yeah, sorry, it's right there. Make a total of three voluntary requests, two oral requests, 15 days apart. They see you guys know your stuff. That was a trick question. <laughs> that was a trick question. Uh, trick answer. <laughs> uh, so I just wanted to uh, reiterate that, and now I forgot my other point, so I'm gonna- well, I'm just gonna make a point that I personally think that's a silly criterion. Borrowed from hospice, to me, the amount of suffering is should be the criteria, not how long you have to live, which is the criteria in Europe. It's unbearable suffering as determined by the patient. I know. What, I, know I, I was going to call on Karen Van Dyke, and I always have to introduce okay. her as the founder of the Death Cafes yeah. in San Diego. Yeah. Can I just add, sorry, one more thing on that, really quickly. Sorry, Karen. Um, even when people get go through the process, I just want to be, remind that a half to one third of the individuals that got a prescription that they were eligible for it didn't use it. So the idea, just to kind of that you know, if you start the process, once again, it's, it's about comfort knowing 
um, that you have the medication available. So I just kind of wanted to reiterate, just because people go forward with this process doesn't mean, it's like this is what they want, but it doesn't have to, have to one third of an organ don't take the prescription. Because they can't swallow by that time. So, so I just wanted to, I just point. wanted to. Yeah. Karen. So um, I have an aunt, Faith, aware of her. She's 102, almost 103 in June. She's been hospitalized September, October, November. All of that time I was trying to get the doctors to agree to do hospice. Finally got that three weeks ago. So since then, I have been talking to hospices, and one of the very first questions that I ask is about the law. And every single one of them says to me, well, it's not law yet. Right. So, so, that's so you know, it's, it's, it's frustrating because we don't know exactly when the law is going to take place, but, you know, what's in, what's in place to, one, give people the hospices somewhere that we can access, the hospices that are on board, with this, and two, what is being done proactively to go out and instead of the hospice picking up the phone and calling us, what's being done proactively to go to them to say, you need to be talking right. about this? Well, the, that's kind of some of the work that I'm doing is really about the outreach and put, letting people know that we're a resource. But CHATCA has really been doing a good job in trying to, California Hospice and Palliative Care Association, to do webinars and make it front and center. I mean, it, at their conference, and the first two webinars of this year are on this topic. Um, so I think that they're really wanting to make sure people do uh, talk about it. And, and it really happens within. It, it's you as an individual kind of saying, this is what my, my mother wants. You, you're going to have to address this because I'm asking you. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and once again, we're training doctors and other healthcare professionals throughout the state to be able to continue to have more conversations with hospices. Um, we also have, um, you know, practice policy statements, um, and not practice policy statements, as well as um, CMEs where doctors can come in and do more education and training. It's also important to understand that statutorily, hospice has no responsibility under the law to provide um, any assistance with finding participating physicians or finding participating pharmacies. In fact, many hospice providers will tell you this isn't what we do. Hospice neither hinders nor hastens the dying process. And we actually, you know, we will refer you to an organization that can help you but there isn't really very much that we can do for you. Now in Washington, some hospices are doing much more than others. Mm -hmm. Group Health has a dedicated social worker and finds its patients the two physicians they need and fills the prescription. Other hospices just simply say, you know, we don't really deal with that. Um, you know, here's information, you know, here's an organization that will be, you know, that will be helpful to you. So it's important to kind of understand that your medical providers are not going to uh, are not going to be really terribly proactive and step up to the plate and you know you know be right behind you in your in your efforts to use this law. You're going to have to be determined, uh, determined and a, a strong advocate in the same way that you've been advocating for your 102 year old mother to get hospice you will have to advocate for yourselves to have access to the End of Life Options Act. Um, it's, not, it's, not, it's not easy. It's not going to be easy. And it's not even easy when you've got an organization like End of Life Washington that's been around since the beginning of the passage of the law to find physicians for people, especially those people living in very rural areas or conservative areas. Sometimes those people have to travel long distances to see a supportive physician. But we do want to do that here, especially for our own members. And we will have a program, let's see, March is the Alzheimer's one, April, May would be on hospice. We would like to invite hospice people here to talk about what their policy will be on this subject, including a man uh, that came to our meeting on Friday at UCSD who runs a boutique hospice service and gave me his, well, somebody else gave me his brochure. So you can take a look at that. 
he seems interested in the end of life options. I can't see over there. I'm developing a left bias. What is the holdup in ending this special session? Yeah. Is there a limitation on how much longer we must wait? Yeah. Thank you. The holdup in ending this special session. What's going on? There's. Well, the legislation's at the session be in and out, but it's it's really about the work that was originally in the, in the special session as it been reviewed and, and dealt with and so on. And I believe it's a year, so it was, there's a little more time, but we know, like I said, that's, we know for sure um, between April, April this year and January, but we have some, we have good, we have a good, um, and take to, to kind of know that we have people working on the ground in Sacramento on this. So we're still on it. It's part of my, some of my colleagues are still on it to be making sure this moves forward. What's the holdup? There's conversations still going on there. And that uh, hopefully by um, midsummer that will happen. Yeah, but two friends who were terminal and one died. And they both wanted aid and dying, one still alive and hoping that there would be provisions for her before she dies, and the other one died, and yeah, it's not great. So. Will it wind up and not more than one year? Is there a maximum that they January 2017. January, that will be, so it's, it's, it's definitely, yeah. Ken Fousel back there. I'd like to perhaps clarify that. Dr. Brown called that special session primarily for a very specific reason, Medicare, in Medi-Cal in California was very seriously underfunded. It's one of the seven states that were put on probation, so to speak, by Medicare and Medicaid because they were not, they did not have an institutional uh, legal way to guarantee that California would provide their portion of the Medi-Cal funding to keep the program going. And so they've been kind of on the edge for two or three years, and this last summer, Medi-Cal sent California notice, get your act together, you've got to comply with the law, or we're going to cut you out. So Governor Brown called a special session, extraordinary session, on top of the regular session, and gave him the first charter, fix Medi-Cal, find a way to finance Medi-Cal. And that was their charter that started the special session. And then on top of that, various other issues were layered on that because the law says as long as the initiative they want to promote is related to the same subject for which the special session was called, yeah, which was which medical, yeah. then, then you can add on that. So that's why SB 128 was able to get in there and to change to AB 2 uh, 115. So that's how it's not under the radar. Otherwise, it would never be able to do it. So, Great. the central will not end yeah, until the like legislator fixes it. Thanks, Ken. Thanks, Ken. I, um, <laughs> That's why he's um, one of the action team leaders. <laughs> Doc, uh, sorry. Did you want to say something? No. Uh, Dr. Mitsumita has green cards for you. And on there, he would like people who want to be what we call calling hemlock guides to do this uh, personal work with people who want to use the law. So if you want to do that, put your name, phone number, and email address. And also, if you would have a house party where we could talk about the law and talk about what Hemlock will do. And of course, if you want to give us a check for $25,000. No. Um, no, really, we're going to have to um, become fundraisers to make this work, but we will do it. So I think we have time for one more critical question. Will Wakely. Okay, uh, question is, is there, will there, can there be a listing of consulting and prescribing doctors? Yes, it'll be confidential, however. Uh, Rob suggested a locked uh, security thing where only our consulting doctors will have the key to it. But what we'll do is get these doctors, and this is what uh, George has suggested too when he came here, that, with the way they did it in Oregon, that if you contact us and you need to use the law and you have talked to your doctor and maybe you want somebody to talk to your doctor again or your doctor won't do it you don't know how to get a doctor uh, our volunteer medical director 
who might be, but will go into the secure list and find a doctor that you could talk to. So the more doctors we have, so when you talk to your own doctor, we would like that feedback. Uh, this doctor was cooperative and will and will be interested to do this when the law goes into effect. Yes, okay, we'll put that in the, in the database. Or this doctor walked out on me when I even suggested that <laughs> we want to know that too. Or this doctor says, well, I don't want to talk about it now. Um, okay, wishy-washy. Maybe he or she needs to be talked to, or but we need to know that too. So we have a phone number. We have a um, very complicated phone system now that we set up. And we have uh, an email address. So let us know, uh, and a physical address, let us know what kind of result you had from your own doctor. And we will enter this in our very sophisticated <laughs> database, we hope. In fact, if anybody wants to volunteer to do a sophisticated database, we would like to know. Oh, Rob. Yeah, just to add to what Faye is saying, in Washington we have over 400 supportive physicians across the state now, and um, these physicians are listed in our database as willing to prescribe, willing to consult. We also um, keep track of physicians who don't participate. So if a physician, a patient comes to us and says their doctor is, you know, Dr. Smith, at such and such, we can say, okay, well, <coughs> Dr. Smith is not going to help you, and uh, you know, save your breath. Um, so it's, it is important to to give all feedback about physicians. And the other thing that we do is that we promise these physicians who are supportive and, and willing to consult and prescribe that their names will never be provided to the general public. Mm -hmm. We will only provide their contact information in the context of a relationship with one of our client support volunteers. So as you can imagine, the issue is controversial, not as controversial as abortion, thankfully. But, um, you know, if a prescribing physician's office is targeted by opponents and it becomes news, you can imagine how discouraging it would be for our other physicians um, to participate in the law. And one uh, final thing that I, I think would be important to say is, you know, there, you know, Faye mentioned there are some limitations to the law, and you know that, you know, in an in an ideal world, suffering or that would be would determine whether you could use the law or not. You know, this law still does enable a significant number of people to die on their own terms, um, when, where, and how they want to die, with the people that they want with them when they die. They have the, 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 uh, the option of setting a date. They can say, I'm sorry, um, you know, forgive me, I forgive you, I love you, thank you for taking care of me. Um, they can get closure in a way that many people just aren't able to do before they die. Because they slip into a coma or they end up in the emergency room and on life support and lose consciousness. And so these deaths can be quite beautiful. And one situation we had at um, End of Life Washington in particular, we had a woman with end stage melanoma who um, went through the entire process and acquired the medication. In fact, uh, this person is someone that I know um, personally. Um, and towards the end of her life, she was offered the ability to participate in uh, an experimental study of a new drug to treat melanoma. And remarkably, her melanoma was cured, um, completely cured. She's in wow. remission from end-stage melanoma. So, um, wow. Jimmy Carter. Um, so things change. Anyway, she. She told me that um, that one of her regrets was she owned a hair salon in um, kind of northern Seattle, that she never had opened this hair salon in downtown because 
You know, if you open one in downtown, it means you've arrived. You know, you. you know, <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't understand the dynamics of the hair of the salon industry. But uh, she always, you know, she regretted never having opened the salon. So she opened the salon downtown, and um, she had a grand opening party. And um, you know, as as a friend, of course, I sent flowers and um, um, used my friend Mark Young, an old friend. Um, Florist and said Mark sent flowers to uh, Julie for her uh, grand opening. And so I went to the grand opening and uh, there were a couple bouquets there and I, I didn't see the one that I sent. And, um, and I said, well, where, uh, Julie, where's the one I sent? And she said, well, I think there's probably a mistake. And well, here, let me show you. So she took me behind the receptionist's desk and there was a, a display with these dark red gladiolos that said, rest in peace. <laughs> and, uh, so, so, uh, so, okay, I did not send that. Uh, uh, I'm pretty sure a mistake occurred. So I called Mark um, the next day. And I said, Mark, um, what's up with sending my friend, the person who nearly died from cancer, the rest in peace, um, okay? And he said, uh, Oh my God! I can't believe that happened, and I'm so sorry. And there was, you know, a mix-up, and he just went on and on. And was saying, "Okay, Mark, it's no big deal. Just, just send her the bouquet that I had intended her to receive." And he said, "No, you don't understand. There were only two deliveries that day, and if the one that said rest in peace went to your friend's grand opening, the one that said good luck in your new location went." <laughs> Thanks for coming.